Movies get their ideas from all sorts of places, like how Star Wars borrows from the works of Kurosawa, or how the movie Wild Wild West is based on a near-death experience I had when my CD player fell into the bathtub while I was listening to seminal Will Smith album Big Willy Style. You prove it's not. With all this creative cross-pollination happening in Hollywood, it's probably only fair that video games are ripping off movies with the kind of shameless abandon of a kid borrowing someone else's homework four minutes before it's due to be handed in. At least that's how I understand the legal concept of fair use, so let's take a look at these following things that video games just straight up stole from movies. Allegedly. Here she is. <laughs> Willamette, Colorado. Population 53,594. Distinguishing characteristics, jack shit. <laughs> About the only thing to do in this town is kill time at the shopping mall. The first Dead Rising game launched in 2006 trapped photojournalist Frank West in a zombie-filled shopping complex with only his wits and a mall's worth of consumer goods to save him. <laughs> It's an arresting premise for a game that combines both our daydream of surviving a zombie apocalypse and our daydream of running riot in a shopping mall, doing whatever we want without being pursued by a huffy security guard. It's also uncannily similar to George A. Romero's classic zombie movie, Dawn of the Dead. Now, the Night of the Living Dead series of zombie films has, like Luge at the Winter Olympics, been going downhill since the 1960s. But in the early days, the zombie movies successfully layered gross zombie horror with social commentary, such as in Romero's 1978 gruesome and satirical Dawn of the Dead. So, Dawn of the Dead is a film about zombies set in an American shopping mall. Dead Rising is a game about zombies set in an American shopping mall. Did you spot the similarity? The similarity certainly didn't escape the notice of the company with ownership of Dawn of the Dead, which was of the opinion that Dead Rising had ripped off the movie and threatened to sue Dead Rising publisher Capcom back in 2008. The suit was eventually settled in favour of Capcom when it was deemed Dead Rising had none of the social commentary that distinguishes Dawn of the Dead. When the zombies came, everyone died! <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, you're telling me that wasn't social commentary? Well, all right, you're the presiding judge on this lawsuit. Designing genuinely terrifying monsters is really hard work, and honestly, what's even the point when H.R. Geiger already designed the best one, the Xenomorph, all the way back in 1979? That's why a lot of game developers often throw their hands up in resignation and decide, f*** it, let's just slightly change an alien from Alien. That's how we got the game Alien Breed, the final boss of Echo the Dolphin, the final boss of Conker's Bad Fur Day, the entire game Xenophobe, the Wanamingos from Fallout 2. How long is this list? I'm not reading all this. It's just a lot, okay? To our minds though, the most high profile and blatant of these ripoffs is the Resident Evil 4 boss you encounter in the sewers, known as the Verdugo. The Verdugo is basically H.R. Geiger's alien wearing a hat, and you meet it several times throughout the game, in its role as Salazar's right hand. Your right hand comes off? This is hardly the time for jokes, Leon. In these appearances, the Verdugo is wearing a robe that goes a long way towards hiding its copyright infringing body. But when you face it in the sewers, it becomes painfully obvious that this is one of those can I copy your homework memes waiting to happen. That's it, I'm calling the HR department. That's the department we have for matters related to HR Geiger. It comes up surprisingly often. Ask anyone who's seen an actual street fight and they'll tell you they aren't usually colourful exotic affairs. Well, it's only one colour, red, and it's a nightmare to get out of your karate gi, let me tell you. Not so the street fighting seen in Street Fighter 2, The World Warrior, in which your chosen street fighter jets around the world to challenge mystic Indian yogis, Brazilian jungle men, Russian bear wrestlers, and Val Kilmer from Top Gun.
Guile isn't the only thing Street Fighter nicked from the movies, however, a fact that won't have passed by fans of the 1975 Charles Bronson movie, Hard Times. In this film, Bronson plays a drifter who makes money by entering backstreet bare-knuckle brawling contests, or street fights, making him, I guess, a street fighter. 2. The World Warrior A closer inspection of some of the locations these fights take place in, though, reveals undeniable inspiration for both Zangief's stage and Ken's stage when Bronson fights an opponent on the docks. Talking to Capcom, Street Fighter artist Akira Akiman Yasuda even admitted to what he called open plagiarism, which was apparently fine back then because video games were a niche concern that didn't make anyone any money. Street Fighter made 10 billion dollars. Was that more or less than Hard Times took at the box office? Wait, don't tell me, I'll look it up later. Round one, fight! Still, at least the iconic music from Ken's stage was a wholly original composition, right? Sorry, what's this? It's Mighty Wings by Cheap Trick. Oh my god. You could argue that 1991 beat-em-up Burning Fight had already borrowed a whole bunch of stuff from Double Dragon, and once you've started borrowing, why stop there? And before you give me the whole, maybe it's a coincidence thing, one of the player characters is literally a blonde guy called Billy, just like in Double Dragon. Either it's a total rip-off, or there was some sort of character name shortage in the early 90s. But hey, it must be difficult coming up with three whole unique playable characters. And that's why one of the other characters looks almost identical to Guy from Final Fight. So if Burning Fight struggled this hard with designing original player characters, imagine how hard it was to come up with the enemies. That's why Burning Fight just went straight for the most famous, identifiable, professional wrestler in the world, Hulk Hogan. It's fun! Ah, if only you'd gone for Honky Tonk Man, you might have gotten away with it. Alright, technically Hulk Hogan is a wrestler and wrestling is on television, but he had a movie career too. Who could forget such cinematic classics as Suburban Commando, Mr. Nanny, and Santa with Muscles? Look, we didn't specify that they had to be good movies. And what have they named this beautiful, totally unique, legally distinct creation? Bulk Brogan? The Sulkster? Nope, it's Tom Anderson. Whoa, maybe there really was a character name shortage. <laughs> The recent Friday the 13th game has taught me two things. One, the situation surrounding the rights to the Friday the 13th movies is complicated. And two, many simple household objects can be used for murder if you use your head. The point is that the rights to Friday the 13th are complicated, as evidenced by how this Friday the 13th game won't be getting any new content released for it ever, thanks to a tangled legal situation over who owns the rights to Jason Voorhees striding around the place in a boiler suit and hockey mask, slicing up camp counsellors with a machete. That's probably why the developers of 1988 Splatterhouse decided that instead of dealing with all that legal nonsense, what they'd do instead was call their character, who was a guy who liked striding around the place in a boiler suit and hockey mask slicing up monsters with a machete, Rick Taylor. See? Totally different to Jason Voorhees. Despite being a pretty bland beat-em-up and featuring a boss fight against a chair, Splatterhouse proved popular enough to warrant two sequels and a 2010 reboot, all of which switched the mask design to be a lot more skull-like because yes, that makes it better. Look at this guy. No way anyone's mistaking him for Jason Voorhees. You're mine. Still, maybe we've found a solution to the Friday the 13th game update situation. Who wants to play as Blason Bloorhees? 
He's the same basic character, but his mask is a paper plate with a scary face drawn on it. By the DLC. My name is... My name is Pliskin. Iroquois Pliskin, Lieutenant Junior Grade. According to the Twitter bio of Metal Gear creator Hideo Kojima, 70% of his body is made of movies. That's a stat that probably applies to his video games as well. From his early work in Police Noughts, which borrowed heavily from Lethal Weapon, and Snatcher, which was basically Blade Runner in all but name, Kojima loves to magpie things that he loves from movies and put them into his video games. But none of Kojima's various homages are more obvious than Snake, the main character of the Metal Gear series, a former spy, spec ops agent, and cast iron ripoff of Snake Plissken from John Carpenter's Escape from New York. For the record, I'm going to refer to all the playable characters in Metal Gear games as Snake here. And yes, I know some of them are different people, or clones, or body doubles who've had plastic surgery, but they're all basically the same character, all right? Feel free to tell me how wrong I am to have done this in the comments. Oh, Raiden, he's not Snake. Yeah, well, yeah, I won't be referring to Raiden in this section. I mean, <laughs> you said all the playable characters. Oh my god. <laughs> tell, tell it to the comments, Jane. Okay. Keep it in there. Okay. Firstly, there's the name. Snake even goes by the alias Iroquois Pliskin in Metal Gear Solid 2, and the fact that they're both infiltrators who keep in contact with people over a radio. Plus, although literally no one is as rugged as early 80s Kurt Russell, I think we can all agree that Snake is giving it a damn good go. By the way, sorry to disappoint you, but I did manage to smuggle out my smokes. Instead of going the Splatterhouse route and changing things slightly to avoid potentially costly comparisons, Kojima doubled down on the whole thing, adding an eye patch to Snake in Metal Gear Solid 3, just in case anyone was in doubt as to what Kojima's favourite movie was. It's so close that you'd think somebody would have been sued. In fact, somebody almost was sued, that person being Hideo Kojima. Apparently, the company that owned the rights to Escape from New York wanted to go after Kojima for ripping off their movie, but were stopped when director John Carpenter stepped in. Turns out Carpenter is a big video game fan and actually gets on well with Kojima. Well, that is, until he sees that all the dialogue in Death Stranding is just Norman Reedus and Mads Mikkelsen reciting the entire screenplay of Big Trouble in Little China. Son of a bitch must pay. Hey, that's up to the courts to decide, Kurt. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is the story of four human-sized turtles who live in the sewer, eat pizza, and their dad is a rat. Yet somehow, this sewer pizza nightmare went from obscure comic book to legit cultural phenomenon in the late 80s and early 90s. The adventures of ninjas Leonardo, Raphael, Donatello, and Michelangelo were turned into cartoons, movies, toys, and video games, teaching children the merits of honor, discipline, and diverse merchandising strands. Prepare to die! Oh, which reminds me, buy our t-shirts! Link below. Obviously, the rampant success of Turtles and its associated merch caught the eye of game developers like Rare, who scrambled to come up with muscular, wise-cracking, anthropomorphic creatures of their own, which is how we ended up with Battletoads. Exactly like the Turtles, the Battletoads were lean, green fighting machines, only instead of being named after the Renaissance's finest artists, they were named after skin conditions. Way to set the tone, guys. Like most hasty cash-ins, Battletoads ended up being quite bad and included the legendarily unfair Turbo Tunnel section, which was the leading cause of snapped controllers in the early 1990s. Okay. Oh, come on! I did the jump! Somehow, though, the Toads returned for a further four games, and there's apparently an upcoming one still in development for Xbox One, proving that there's still an appetite for TMNT knockoffs. Which is great news for my original franchise, the Toxic Tween Age Samurai Terrapins. Right, still available, incredibly. Wow, those are all pretty close to things from movies, but it all seemed to work out well for everyone in the end. And if you want this video to work out well for you, then you can go on to another great video. Up here is uh, something from Outside Extra, which is about video game movies that we all really like. Down here is a video from us, which is one of our Hitman Let's Plays. If you've not seen any of those, they're great fun, you should check them out. And I am going to check out the new episode of the Toxic Teenage Samurai Terrapins. What a great franchise. Do invest. <laughs>